Hey folks, it's time for a Star Trek video once again, and once again, it's one of those Star Trek videos into which I put the absolute minimum of effort, you know what I'm talking about, not actually Trek Actually, the proper scripted Trek Actually video comes out next week, this week, it's a not actually Trek Actually, and I wanted to talk about one of my favorite little corners of Star Trek lore of the Trek franchise. And it's it up until relatively recently, it's been largely overlooked by most people, except for the most hardcore of we Star Trek nerds. And I'm talking about Star Trek the Animated Series. Now, Star Trek the Animated Series is having a little tiny bit of a moment recently. It used to be almost entirely an afterthought. It was not even mentioned for the most part. When you would talk about the Star Trek TV shows. You would you would tick off all the Star Trek TV shows that there have been so far, and you'd go, oh, well, let's see, there's a Classic Trek, and then there's TNG, and then there's Deep Space Nine, and then there's Voyager, and then there's Enterprise, and now, of course, we have Discovery, and coming up very soon next year will be Picard, and, and you, don't, you don't even mention Star Trek The Animated Series, but Star Trek The Animated Series was the second entry in the franchise. It was, it, it came out of four years after the cancellation of classic Trek. And it was Star Trek's first attempt at a comeback. It was the first attempt by Gene Roddenberry and his writers and the producers and, and the, the holders of the intellectual property to reignite the franchise, to take advantage of the growing interest of the fan base. All these people in the early 70s that were discovering Star Trek through the reruns, and they were thinking, wow, I really love this. This is such a fun show. Why isn't this still on the air? Why aren't they making more of this? And they made more in their first attempt at making more Star Trek before the movies kicked off and really blew it up and made it into a phenomenon was Star Trek the Animated Series. So I have written a few notes down uh, about Star Trek the Animated Series. So this will be not not a complete half-assed uh, video. It will, it will not be... Yeah, it's very nice. And honestly, as I've said before, they all wind up in the same playlist, so who gives a shit? Anyway, so Star Trek The Animated Series is having a bit of a moment, as I said, and one of the main reasons why it's having a bit of a moment right now, especially this month, is that there was just published the first official guide to Star Trek The Animated Series, and that official guide is titled Star Trek The Official Guide to the Animated Series, which makes sense. That's a good title. If you're going to call that book something, that's what you call it. And it is by uh, Aaron Harvey of TrekMovie.com and his co-author Rich Shepis. And I don't know Rich, but I know Aaron a little bit. We've become Facebook friends, and Aaron is a really cool guy, and I imagine Rich would be the same. And uh, he is a huge nerd for Star Trek The Animated Series. He hosted a podcast that was about Star Trek in the 70s and had a lot to say about... Uh, uh, Star Trek the Animated Series in particular. So, yeah, people are starting to discover animated Star Trek. And there are there are uh, additional uh, Star Trek animated shows um, being produced. We know that there are, there are two new uh, animated Trek shows currently in production. There's Lower Decks, which is going to be on uh, CBS All Access, I think, next year. And then there's also the Nickelodeon show that will be aimed at kids that doesn't even have an official title yet, as far as we know, that will come out at some point, and a couple of the upcoming uh, short treks will be animated as well. So, th so there's there's a lot of animated Star Trek stuff in the air all of a sudden, which is very cool. And uh, we we've been sort of pushed, compelled to take another look at Star Trek the Animated Series, and there's a lot there uh, to enjoy. I think if you watch Star Trek the Animated Series, um, it was actually the first Star Trek show that I owned all of on DVD, and that's for obvious reasons. They're, they only actually made 22 episodes of Star Trek The Animated Series. Uh, it was aired over two seasons, but in, a to in total it was only 22 episodes, and they released it on DVD, and it's just one box set. You know, you don't have to buy seven of them like you have to for TNG and DS9 and Voyager. Uh, you can just get every episode of Star Trek The Animated Series in one uh, sort of clamshell case, and it, so it was the first Trek show that I ever owned the entire series on a DVD, and actually that was where I discovered a lot of it. I, I watched it on the DVDs in, in many cases for the first time. I had seen maybe about half of it over the years uh, here and there, just caught an episode if it happened to be on somewhere. But uh, seeing it in the DVD case and actually getting to watch it from beginning to end was a real thrill for me as a Star Trek fan because I, I came to it relatively late in my Star Trek fandom 
you know, I was already, you know, a, a long time lifelong fan. And I felt like there was this whole new era, this, this whole new uh, sort of field of Star Trek, this, this whole new region of the franchise that, that I had not explored yet. And I got to check out the animated series for the first time in my 30s, which was very cool. Um, there are not, not everybody who watches animated Trek uh, enjoys it. There, there are there are people who are diehard Star Trek fans who love Star Trek just as much as any of us who say, I don't really get the animated series. I don't like it. It's not my thing. I've watched it, but I don't really feel like I need to revisit it. And I disagree with that, but I can completely understand that. And I've written down a few uh, reasons why someone might not like Star Trek the Animated Series, which seem to me to be completely reasonable opinions to have. Opinions that I don't necessarily share, or if I do share them, they don't uh, they, they don't compel me to not watch the show or not want to enjoy the show, but uh, very poor animation. If you know anything about American TV animation and you hear the name Filmation, you know exactly what you're getting. Filmation was notoriously cheap. Filmation was the company that you hired to do your show if you just wanted to get a show on the air for a low cost by a particular air date. Filmation, I won't necessarily say that they did bad work because often they did surprisingly good work given how low their production value was. Um, but they weren't lushly animated. It was very minimal animation, not quite clutch cargo level. Like there, it was proper animation. <laughs> Uh, but the animation was, was relatively poor, uh, especially by today's standards and even by the standards of 1970s children's television. There were, there were some better animated shows on the air even back then when, when Star Trek the Animated Series uh, was actually airing. The vocal performances are not necessarily all that great. Um, they were a little repetitive sometimes because the w another trademark of Filmation is that the supporting voices were almost always done by the same two or three people. And often it was uh, Lou Scheimer, who was the executive producer and sort of the, uh, the kingpin of Filmation. He would step in and do background voices or supporting character voices himself, himself to, to save money so they wouldn't have to hire um, other actors to do voices. Uh, and so you'll hear Lou Scheimer's voice in a lot of Filmation stuff, playing guest characters and one-off characters. And also the uh, the vocal performances of the main cast of Shatner, Nimoy, DeForest Kelly, etc., etc., um, are not always up to the standard you might be used to from classic Trek, because uh, in many cases they were not recording as an ensemble. Some of the episodes they were able to get together in a studio and record as an ensemble. But in many cases, especially when it came to getting Shatner Shatner and Nimoy's voices, they were recorded separately and often not even uh, in the studio. They would they would record their lines on the road if they were uh, starring in a play or had to do something in another part of, of, of the country, which they did often in the 70s before the, uh, the Star Trek money train really came in with the movies in the 80s. Uh, so the vocal performances aren't exactly up to snuff always. Um, and uh, until recently, it had a very questionable status as Star Trek canon, if you care about that sort of thing. If you watch my videos, you know I could not give less of a shit about canon. Uh, but a lot of folks find issues of canon really important, and it matters to them whether or not the events in the show, quote-unquote, actually happened as far as the fictional Star Trek universe is concerned. And they seem to be leaning a little bit more toward considering Star Trek the Animated Series canon these days, but for many, many years after it was initially released, it was relegated to non-canonical or mostly non-canonical status. There are some parts of it that have been referenced in other shows since then that now we would consider canon. Uh, for instance, parts of it were mentioned uh, in, in a couple episodes of Enterprise or a few things here and there that were just mentioned or brought up in subsequent movies or TV shows that we would now consider canon. Um, but, but largely it has been considered non-canon uh, for, for a very long time. And again, these are all reasons why people might not like it or be as interested in it. None of those reasons I just mentioned bothered me at all. And especially the, uh, the having poor animation and low production value doesn't bother me at all because one of the other sort of flagship series that was produced by Filmation, perhaps its most famous series, was uh, in the 1980s. Filmation produced the uh, the He-Man cartoon, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. And also its, its spin-off uh, She-Ra... The Princess of Power. And I was a huge fan 
of both of those shows. In fact, uh, when She-Ra was introduced, she was introduced in a movie called The Secret of the Sword that actually played in theaters. And, uh, and I got to see it. I, I went to see He-Man and She-Ra, The Secret of the Sword, in theaters and got to see the animated He-Man, the classic filmation 1980s He-Man on the big screen. It was one of the great thrills of my young movie-going existence to see that movie. And uh, after that, I made sure I watched She-Ra just as much as I watched He-Man. And yeah, I was a little boy, and I watched She-Ra just like I watched He-Man. Even though I was a boy and She-Ra was a girl show, I didn't care. And you know what else? I had the She-Ra action figures, which were basically just uh, pint-sized Barbie dolls. They even had the combable hair, right? They were aimed at girls. I got them because I liked He-Man. And She-Ra was a part of He-Man, so I wanted a She-Ra figure too. And I just, I thumbed my nose at my, my socially prescribed gender role that said, oh, you're a little boy, you don't play with toys like that. I thumbed my nose at it. I disregarded it like it wasn't even there. Because even then, as a five and six year old kid, I was a budding SJW. And I told my friends about it too. I didn't, I didn't hide my She-Ra toys when my, when my, my fellow guy friends from, from school, from kindergarten and first grade would come over and hang out and want to play He-Man action figures. I had my She-Ra shit out in the open so they could see it. Because not only back then was I a budding SJW, and we didn't even know what that was back then, I was a virtue signaling SJW as a kindergartner and a first grader. I didn't care. I wanted people to know that I was better than them because I was transcending my gender role. So it was really just with the She-Ra stuff, the gender. I mean, I, I stuck pretty rigidly to the assigned gender role other than that and have and still do to this day. But what was I supposed to do? Not get an action figure of He-Man's sister? I mean, come on. Anyway, so yeah, because Filmation uh, was so notoriously cheap and they reused stuff from other shows, one of the cool things, if you are a fan of both Star Trek The Animated Series and the He-Man She-Ra shows, uh, you can notice things that were reused from Star Trek in He-Man and in She-Ra. Things like sound effects and character designs and like background characters and settings. A lot of the uh, the alien planets that the crew of the Enterprise would beam down onto in Star Trek the Animated Series would turn up many years later as backgrounds for Eternia or, or other uh, settings uh, on uh, the He-Man cartoon. So that, that's, pretty, that's pretty cool. Uh, now, those are all the reasons why you might not like the show. And again, I don't, I don't share those reasons or I, I, I don't consider them reasons why I don't like the show, but I respect them. But there are lots of reasons, I think, as a Star Trek fan and as a particular appreciator of the animated series, to like the show. One of the big ones is that Star Trek the Animated Series is essentially the fourth season of Star Trek. And that's pretty cool. Because it was animated, you got to see a lot more creative character designs and, and alien world designs. And they got to do cool things that they couldn't do in the live action show. Like they could beam into settings where there wasn't a breathable atmosphere. They didn't have to rely on the conceit of, oh, it's a class M planet. We don't need spacesuits. We can just beam down and breathe the air. They gave them these cool little uh, force field spacesuits. They would just put a belt on and push a button and a force field would, would go around their bodies that was filled with air so they could go into space or they could go into ships that didn't have life support or down on alien worlds that didn't have a breathable atmosphere. And, and it, was, it was no extra cost for the show. They just had to draw a, a force field around the characters. And it really sort of expanded the universe of Star Trek and, and let us see the characters doing things that we couldn't have seen them do in, in classic Trek, which is very cool. Uh, a lot of the writing staff for TAS was brought back from TOS, most notably Dorothy Fontana, who was one of the great dependable writers on Classic Trek, and she came back and wrote episodes of Star Trek the Animated Series, and I think was uh, the story editor as well. She was she had a lot of um, of influence on Star Trek the Animated Series, and and was really uh, a big person responsible for for the relatively high quality of the writing, and also David Gerald, uh, who wrote. The Trouble with Tribbles and came back for the animated series and, and wrote uh, some episodes as well. There are some really, really solid episodes in Star Trek, the animated series. One of the, the most celebrated episodes is, I think it was the second episode they ever aired. Uh, it's called Yesteryear, and it's not only a really terrific Spock episode, but it also functions as a quasi-sequel 
to the city on the edge of forever because they revisit uh, the Guardian of Forever. And Spock has to go back in time to complete kind of a time travel loop. He has to sort of complete a destiny loop, a predestination loop, by going back in time and uh, allowing his younger self to do something that he needs to do in order for his life to continue the way it has. And you get to see Spock's backstory. You get to see Sarek again, and, and Mark Leonard does come back and do the voice of Sarek. And you get to see a little bit of Vulcan that you haven't seen before. Uh, and it's just a really, really cool episode. It's a lot of neat trivia for Spock lovers and Vulcan lovers. And, and that was one of the episodes where they picked things up and they mentioned things in Enterprise. Like, for instance, uh, The Forge, the, the Vulcan wilderness where, where young Vulcans were supposed to go out and sort of survive and complete this survival ritual to prove that they were, they were adults. And elements of that were picked up and mentioned in episodes of Enterprise. Um, also, there's another episode, again, uh, uh, an episode that has a lot of Spock stuff in it that is notable for Spock's role in it, called The Infinite Vulcan, which is the episode where a giant uh, clones Spock, and we see a giant Spock. And, and he's still there at the end of the episode. That's another cool thing about, for me, again, as someone who doesn't really care about canon and likes to embrace the silliness of Star Trek when I come up to it... Um, the animated series has lots of stuff in it that it's like, oh, wow, that's wacky. And now that's there. Even if, you know, it depends on whether you consider it canon or not. But according to Star Trek, the animated series, there's a planet out there in the galaxy somewhere where there is a gigantic Spock, a gigantic clone of Spock just hanging out. And that's so cool to me. And that episode was written by Walter Koenig who was Chekhov, of course, in the original series and would reprise the role in the films. And uh, Walter Koenig was the only member of the original cast who they could not afford to bring back to do the voices. He was sort of a, la a last-in, first-out kind of thing because he was uh, the, the most recent addition to the regular cast. So they could bring back the big three. They could afford to bring back Shatner and Nimoy and uh, DeForest Kelly. They could afford to bring back James Doohan. And they almost didn't bring back Nichelle Nichols and George Takei. And Leonard Nimoy, I believe, was actually the one who put his foot down and said, look, uh, they were in the original show. They were part of our cast from season one. So if you're going to do this and you want us to come along, or at least if you want me to come along as Spock, you're going to have to hire George Takei and, and Nichelle Nichols as well. And they, they agreed to, to not invite Walter Koenig because he was added in the second season. And they thought, oh, okay, well, if, if there's a budgetary reason why you can't afford to have all of us, then I guess we'll have to leave out Walter. But they did invite Walter Koenig to write an episode. And the episode he wrote was The Infinite Vulcan, which is just such a cool episode. It's so cool to think that there's an episode of Star Trek that includes a giant clone of Spock that was written by the actor who played Chekhov. That just, to me, is a very cool little bit of Star Trek trivia. And there's a lot of general weirdness like that in the show. Uh, and we also get, speaking of Chekhov's absence, because Chekhov is not in the show, the navigator that we most often see on the bridge of the Enterprise is Lieutenant Eriks, who has a third arm jutting out of his chest and is has pink skin and is very much an alien. Is again, one of those character designs that we wouldn't have been able to really see in the original series. Because of uh, art and animation, you can just draw him in there. And so Lieutenant Eric's again, is a really cool um, uh, addition to the show. And I keep keep hoping that one of the live action shows will will show us Lieutenant Eric's in live action with computer animation or, or more advanced makeup or costume design that we could see a live action uh, Lieutenant Eric's and, and bring him fully into the Star Trek uh, live action canon because I always really enjoyed Lieutenant Eric's. And also Lieutenant uh, Mares, who is the, the cat lady who appears in some of the episodes. Also, I mentioned this in my holodeck episode of Trek Actually, the animated series is the first appearance of the holodeck, or, or of something like the holodeck. They call it the recreation room, uh, but it seems very holodeck-like. They can interact with very realistic simulations of environments. That, that was first introduced in Star Trek the Animated Series. It also continued Star Trek's commitment to diversity and inclusion. Star Trek the Animated Series was the first Star Trek show to show us a Native American member of Starfleet, one of the uh, crew members of the Enterprise in an episode of the Animated Series, is Ensign Walking Bear in the episode How Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth. And also there's an episode called The Lorelei Signal where the women of the Enterprise have to take command of the ship after the men are all sort of incapacitated or distracted by this 
Celestial Siren song. And there's an episode, that one of my favorite episodes of the animated series called The Magics of Magus 2, where there's a character, they meet a character named Lucian, who it turns out was possibly, probably the inspiration for the figure of Lucifer in early Earth in ancient Earth religion. And in Star Trek's version, Lucifer is not the embodiment of evil. He's just a misunderstood guy who was persecuted unfairly. And Captain Kirk risks his life to, to free Lucian, to free Lucifer. And it's a, a very Star Trek story. It's a very cool story. And also there's a sequel episode to Trouble with Tribbles, again, written by David Gerald. And there's another appearance of Harry Mudd. And um, Roger Carmel returns to do the voice of Harry Mudd as well. It is also, and this is a cool bit of Star Trek trivia, the only Star Trek series to date to win a Best Series Emmy. Star Trek The Next Generation was nominated for Best Drama Series in its final season, but didn't win, of course. It was mostly a token nomination, I think, because um, I don't think anybody would argue that Season 7 was the best season of Star Trek The Next Generation, but that's the season that it got its, its Emmy nomination for Best Drama. Uh, but Star Trek The Animated Series was nominated and won the Emmy for Best Children's Series in the 1974-75 Emmys. And the episode that it won for was the aforementioned How Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth, which was the second to last episode that the series ever produced um, and featured Ensign Walking Bear, the, the Native American uh, Enterprise crew member. And it was also co-written by uh, Russell Bates, who was himself a Native American. He was of the Kiowa people. So not only did it have representation and diversity in front of the camera in the form of a Native American character, but it was also written by a Native American writer. So representation behind the camera as well, which is something that Star Trek was not always too quick to pick up on. They were really great at having diversity in front of the camera, but with mostly white men running the show behind the camera for many, many years in the history of Star Trek. Um, but uh, Star Trek, the animated series, bucked that trend just a little tiny bit by having uh, uh, Kiowa member Russell Bates write that episode that, that won it that won the series its only best series Emmy to date. So that's very cool. Again, Star Trek the Animated Series having kind of a moment with the Lower Deck show, with the Nickelodeon show, with the animated episodes of, of Short Treks coming up soon. And uh, there's really never been a better time to discover or revisit Star Trek the Animated Series because it, a lot of people are, are reconsidering it or looking at it either for the first time or, or are coming back to it and thinking, you know, Maybe I should give that another chance. There's a lot that it has going for it. There's something else I forgot to mention that I really appreciate about Star Trek the Animated Series, and that is the episodes are half an hour. And I have long thought that 30 minutes is an ideal running time for a television show, be it cartoon, live action, comedy, or drama. As much as I love classic Star Trek, and God damn it, I love classic Star Trek, some of those episodes feel a little padded. Some of those episodes drag a little bit, and I feel like maybe they would run a lot better. They would play a lot better if they were 30 minutes rather than 60 minutes. And uh, the episodes of Star Trek, the animated series, because it was produced and aired on Saturday morning television as a cartoon, they are 30 minute episodes and they do not have uh, nearly the same pacing problems or, or the problems of dragging a little bit or feeling a little padded as a lot of the, uh, the live action classic uh, Trek show. So that's something else in its favor. And yeah, it's just... It's a lot of fun. It's just such a cool little corner of the Star Trek universe. And I'm so happy f uh, and I'm so grateful to people like Aaron and Rich for their book and, and uh, to all the fans and people who are rediscovering Star Trek, the animated series um, and, and evaluating it and giving it sort of the fresh look that it deserves because it is a, a worthy entry, I think, in the Star Trek franchise. And it deserves better than to just be an afterthought next to the live action shows and, and the films. And thankfully, it seems like that is finally starting to change. And, and Star Trek, the animated series, is having a little bit of a moment in the sun, which it, it very, very richly deserves. So those are just a few of my thoughts and a few of my uh, little factoids about Star Trek, the animated series. A lot of folks have asked if I'm going to do a video about Star Trek, the animated series, and this is the first attempt at doing that. I would love to do a proper Trek Actually video, a scripted video about Star Trek the Animated Series or a particular episode of the Animated Series. So I will do some thinking uh, as far as potential topics that could make use of the Animated Series 
uh, and I will start adding those to the episode polls as I come up with them in the coming months. Speaking of the episode polls, if you are a Patreon patron of mine for any amount, you can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives and vote in the poll for the uh, October episode of Trek Actually. That's coming up. The next Trek Actually that will be up on this channel will be up next week. It will be the Is Star Trek Actually Less Progressive Than We Think episode, which I'm really looking forward to. It's going to be a lot of fun. I also want to remind you, if you love the Star Trek stuff that I do, uh, especially if you like the funny Star Trek stuff, and you're not listening to the Ensign's Log podcast, which is a podcast I co-host with the great Jason Harding, uh, you should listen to the Ensign's Log, the Star Trek-themed comedy podcast where Jason and I play low-ranking officers on a certain legendary Federation starship as it embarks on a certain historic five-year mission. It's a ton of fun. We are very, very deep into our second season, and we love it, and we're so grateful to all of you who listen for supporting the show. And if you haven't listened to the Ensign's Log, check it out. It's linked in the description of this video. Listen on SoundCloud, listen on the website, listen via RSS and your favorite podcast app. However you want to listen to it, please check out the Ensign's Log. Uh, stay tuned next week on this channel. Same Trek time, same Trek channel for the next Trek Actually video about Star Trek being less progressive than we might sometimes think. That's it for this episode of Not Actually Trek Actually. I hope you enjoyed hearing me ramble on about Star Trek the Animated Series for half an hour. I thank you so, so much for, for watching, for your attention and your interest. And I will see you next time. Take care, everybody.